we are going to invite up Dr. Adam Kassen, and as in first class. Please come on up. Adam, you are great to see you. Thank you. Please have a seat. Adam is the uh, Every Nation Leadership Institute Director in Auckland, New Zealand. And I uh, welcome you from, is that called the Down Under also? You could do, um, but I like New Zealand. Okay, all right. <laughs> you could, you could. A little competition there, I think. No, you're um, definitely right there. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, that's fantastic. The ENLI Director, and, and then also you are a professor at the uh, University um, in New Zealand. What's the name of the university? Massey. Massey, Massey university. university. And I understand that right now you're spending time here in the States at Georgetown mm -hmm. University as the Fulbright Visiting Lecturer. So congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. Outstanding. Thank you. And your, your, your emphasis, your field is modern history. It is. Yes, definitely. I, mostly the Second World War is my specialist area. Okay. Uh, do you folks want to know something more? <laughs> you know, that's what I write on. German, German military history, plus I do a number of other things, like the impact of popular culture on history, which is, of course, eminently relevant when we talk about the Da Vinci Code. In other words, people get their ideas about the past from movies. And so I also teach papers on the impact of popular culture in shaping what people know about the past. And on top of that, I teach international relations and politics. So I do a lot of things on a, on a, a kind of a satellite campus. I feel my IQ rising dramatically right Good. now, just sitting beside you in proximity. <laughs> it's my pleasure. So through proxy, I'm, I'm getting smarter by the second here. Um, thank you for being here. Really, it's an honor to host you and last night and then tonight at 6 o'clock uh, as well. Now, here's a question. As a, as a historian, why are you concerned about the Da Vinci Code? Uh, the main reason as a historian, if we take it from that perspective first, is that, as I've already said and alluded to, people do not read history books. And so if I was to ask the audience here, who's seen the movie Titanic? Raise your hands, folks. Who's seen Titanic? Shame on you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Who, who here has seen um, Gladiator? All right. Now, you can put your hands down now. Now, both of those movies are based around historical fact. There was a ship called the Titanic. It did sink. There was a person called Marcus Aurelius and, and, and a son, Commodus. But the problem is, most people don't read a lot of books about Titanic. They don't read a lot of books about the Roman or the classical world. And so they get an impression from the movie that may be untrue. And let's face it, you can't put everything into 150 minutes. So just the very nature of telling a story means that you have to change a few things to make it acceptable for an audience. So oh, that's what I'm concerned about. And, and the Da Vinci Code, when the movie comes out, if it's anything like the book, is going to tell us something about early Christianity, Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, the Knights Templar, which are totally incorrect. Well, just don't say the gladiator's incorrect, please. That's well, it's a lot of fun. It's one of, it's one of my top ten, but okay, okay. <laughs> I won't rain on your parade this morning. We'll, okay. Yeah. Um, appreciate that. We're going to stick with the Da Vinci Code here. Good. Um, now, with 40, there are 40 million books, uh, the Da Vinci Code books, in print yes. and out there around the world. And it's uh, now the, the top, the number one uh, fiction uh, book in, in history. It's the largest selling fiction book ever. And so some people say, well, what about Harry Potter, which has sold a lot of copies? As a set, the Harry Potter set would outsell the Da Vinci Code, but as a si the single volumes, the Philosopher's Stone, Prisoners of Azkaban, etc., the Da Vinci Code far exceeds them all. And of course, what this means is a lot of people are picking it up and reading it. And one of the real problems, Pastor Ron, is if you look at the book, for those of you who have read the book, how many people have read the book? Raise your hands. All right, a good number of you here. And you'll be aware that at the beginning of the book, we have a section which says fact, before mm. the story even starts. At the bottom it says, all descriptions of artwork, architecture, documents, and secret rituals in this novel are accurate. Now, let's just back pedal a little bit here. I read a survey carried out by National Geographic in, 2000, in 2002 talking about what college students in America knew about geography. 
This was just as the US was going to invade Afghanistan. I know it's going to be bad news. You know it's going to be bad news. <laughs> they found that over 80% of American college students aged between 18 and 24, over 80% did not, could not find Afghanistan in, on an atlas, on a map. They 69% did not know where the British Isles were. Catch this. 29% did not know where the Pacific Ocean was. Now, now, just a little hint here, folks. A little hint here. It's the big, wet, blue thing next to California. <laughs> now, if you have a group of people, and Americans are not dissimilar to Kiwis, to Canadians, and other people in the Western world, our education system has failed them. If people lack even basic rudimentary knowledge about geography and history, when they read this, they are just a fantastic candidate to fall for the half-truths that are presented in the book. Yes, there was a person called Constantine. Yes, there was a person called Jesus. Yes, there was a person called Mary Magdalene. There was an organization called the Knights Templar and a person called Leonardo da Vinci. But the facts associated with the person in the book are invariably all wrong. So that, I do have a concern about that as a historian. In, 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 in maybe a sentence or two, why do you think this book has been so popular? People like secrets. They love the idea of cracking a code, and I think it's a CSI phenomenon, just in book form. It's the idea we're discovering something. Uh, the, you know, CSI, the, the evidence is there, and as the story unfolds over 40 minutes, we find out something we didn't know. This book purports to tell us something we didn't know about Christianity. Right, which is the, 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 the holy grail, the holy grail. Of Christianity, which you may want to just explain that. Well, I'm as sure you're going to get into this tonight. I will get into it to, to tonight when we talk about was Jesus married to Mary Magdalene? And um, for those of you who don't know the answer, he was not. Just to give you a little inside information. That will not spoil it for you, by the way, because when somebody asks you, was Jesus married to Mary Magdalene? You say no. They will ask you a whole series of other questions. See, answering no is the easy way out. But my Bible says to study to show yourself approved and to have an answer ready for their questions. Now, the original question you asked me was what, sir? Because I got completely distracted. I think my original question is, why do you think it's so popular? And you said because of the secrecy and the... Yeah, and the, and the codes. And people like that. And on top of that, there is the idea that it kind of confirms their prejudice. To me, this is a spiritual answer now, not the historical answer, but the prejudice against Christianity that is out there in society. They pick Precisely. up the book. And so not only has Dan Brown said it's accurate, it feeds into that prejudice against Christianity that existed all the way back into the time of Nero when Christians were burned and thrown to the lions and people got in a Colosseum and cheered and laughed and encouraged them to be devoured by beasts. There's something in human nature that is very unpleasant and in particular when it comes out about Christianity, there's a very anti-Christian spirit out there. This kind of justifies it and makes them feel better about the beliefs they hold. Do you think this book has negatively affected people's faith in Christ? Josh McDowell has parents coming to him, telling him that the young, the young teenagers have read the book and upon reading it have turned away from their faith. And I was doing a series of five messages in Auckland, New Zealand on the Da Vinci Code. I got halfway through, a member of the congregation came up to me and relayed this story that she had been out in her garden, her neighbor was out gardening, she went and said hello to her, and her neighbor was in tears. And my good friend, a member of our congregation, said, you know, what's the matter, what, what is wrong? And she said, I've just read this book that has told me that everything I've believed in my life is based on a lie. Now, my friends, this is actually a, quite a serious issue here, because this person's faith is now foundering on the rocks of the Da Vinci Code, when it need not be, because the Da Vinci Code has not a historical leg to stand on. But through ignorance, somebody can read this book and believe it. My friend was able to say, I believe the Lord has sent me here to talk to you today for just this purpose, and then was able to invite her to the very next message that I gave on the Da Vinci Code at church. Faith restored, and the person realized, I guess perhaps a little bit sheepishly, why was I so foolish to believe a book? It, it does sell in the fiction section, my friends, at Borders and Barnes and & Noble, and for a good reason. It is fiction. In one sense, it's not really anything new in one sense. It's not. The, and take something like the Gnostic Gospels, which are being promulgated now. Precisely. The Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene. The Christians of the 
second and third century when these gospels were created, long after Jesus walked the earth. So they have, they're nowhere near as good. They, they don't even, you can't even compare them to the New Testament Gospels which were written in the first century by people who either saw Jesus or got their, got their narrative from people who knew Jesus. So we've got people who are making stuff up. Good example, Gospel of Philip, written around 250 AD. We know this as historians. Now you can't tell me, folks, that it was written by the Philip. No, every historian knows it's a pseudonym and the person called it the Gospel of Philip to give it credibility and just made it up. And when Christians of that era got a copy of the Gospel of Philip across their desk, you know, their pastor's office that came across their desk, they said, this is nonsense. They told their congregation it was nonsense, and they wrote books that it was nonsense. And they won that battle because patently it was ridiculous to suggest that someone living 250 years after the event could have anything meaningfully, meaningful to say about the historical Jesus. It's just, an, it's just ridiculous. So they fought that battle. And my concern is, and we laud them for that, and we praise them for that. Now it's our generation. In 200 years, when Christians look back on the Christians of our era, what will they say about what we did when we were challenged in our faith? Were we, were we educated? Were we prepared to give a ready defense? Or do we just say, you know what? John 3.16 is fine for me. That's what got me saved. That's all I need. My friends, we need more than that. That is a great scripture and led many people to salvation and eternal life. But when you go to a university campus, you need to be equipped. And in the job place, oh, just one more statistic. I know we're running out of time, but George Barner said that during the week, an average working week in America, 66% of the people will talk with their colleagues at work or at uh, campuses with their fellow students about television programs they've seen during the week or movies they've watched at theatres. This means this is a fantastic, not just a defence, it's a fantastic offensive evangelical opportunity for you to speak into somebody's life. And not to be harsh with them because they've fallen for it, but in a, in a spirit of tenderness and sensitivity to the fact that they are seekers of truth they really want to know and I think this is this book is an expression of our time people are searching for something more meaningful than what they can get from just science and dead rationality yeah. maybe one last question here in all of your years of preparation to be a PhD in history and the wars and all the things you studied did you ever imagine there would come a time when you would be traveling all over the world <laughs> defending the gospel because of this movie. No, I did not. And that's, I think that's I an interesting not. point for all of us who are here and going through the labor mm. of becoming mathematicians, uh, master's degree, PhD degrees, and the things that many people in this room do. Oftentimes we don't connect the dots, but God knows what he's doing. I, I could not agree more strongly. I was just so proud to see that, because I do the same thing when we have our e and I graduation. And to be equipped... It's not just to be equipped for the ministry of wearing a clerical vest, as it were, or a spiritual garb. In I terms left of a, mine at home. I know, I'm you haven't got that collar on. It is to be equipped as a, as a better mathematician, as a doctor that can minister better to people, to be a better leader in your sports field. If you're a dress or clothing designer, whether you're a musician, that is the real issue because we, we know the story of, of William Wilberforce. He went and saw the author of Amazing Grace, John Newton, and William Wilberforce, my friends, brought an end to slavery in the British Isles. Tens of thousands of people got saved, and he went to John, uh, John Newton, and he said, I, I want to become a preacher. I believe I could do a lot of good. And here's what John Newton said, and this is so important, folks. He said, no, no, don't do that. You will be far more effective in the House of British Parliament than you would ever be being, being a preacher behind a pulpit. Right. Some of you here are going to be far more influential than this man will be. Why? Because in your occupation, you touch so many other different spheres in law, the judicial system, the medical fields. So uh, as you can see, so I, I totally agree. And there's a great movie coming out about Wil Wilberforce very soon. I did not know so that, so I look in, forward to in it. in the makes right now. Dr. Adam, thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you being I here. I appreciate and it. Tonight, tonight, tonight at 6 o'clock. If people have questions, they have friends, they definitely need to invite them. Tonight at 6 o'clock, absolutely. Thank you.